job for FTPC combo and thank you for the beautiful, beautiful music. The combo. Just the combo. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm sick. Scripture reading for today is from 1 uh, Timothy chapter 6, uh, verses 6 to 10, and uh, verses 17 to 19. Timothy 6, 6 to 10, 17 to 19, I will read in time. คำภีร์วันนี้มาจากหนึ่งทิโมธีบทที่หกข้อหกถึงข้อสิบและข้อสิบเจ็ดถึงข้อสิบเก้าหนึ่งทิโมธีบทที่หกข้อหกถึงข
So, uh, in the meantime, uh, today's message just completes what we started two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about why we give money to God through our giving of our tithes and offerings to the church. Then last week, we talked about how we give money. Today, we will talk about living generously and what it takes to make that into a lifestyle that is pleasing to God. Before I talk about living generously, I need to do first a review of the important points of the first two sermons. And for everyone's benefit, I will try to say what I have said before a little differently, uh, although the main points will be the same. Uh, you know, if you approach things in a little different way, uh, hopefully it, uh, it goes better uh, in the mind. So, first of all, when it comes to talking about financial giving to the church, an easy way most people would think about doing it is to treat the church like some kind of nonprofit organization. You know, when it comes to asking for more tithes and offerings, I could just say, you know, hey, we need your financial support. Uh, your money is important to cover our monthly expenses. All of you members are such, you know, such outstanding, such generous and giving people. Uh, you know, this is just a reminder to give. And your giving will make sure that the church continues to keep up with its expenses. You know, that's, that's one way to do it. Uh, you know, you treat the church like any other kind of nonprofit organization. But doing that misses the point of being a church. You know, we're not just any club or nonprofit. We are the body of Christ. Our leader is the son of the living God. And God invites us to look at things mainly from a spiritual and eternal perspective instead of from an earthly or human perspective. God's perspective is what really matters. Um, I mean, for example, when someone dies, would you want someone to say, um, you know what, death is a part of life. You live, you die, and then you're buried six feet underground. Or would you want to hear a word about heaven, about Jesus' resurrection, about the promise and hope of eternal life? Uh, you want the first one, or you want the second one? Second one. Oh, all right. <laughs> Uh, when someone has difficulties in life, would you want to hear someone say, God helps those who help themselves? In other words, would you want self-help? Or would you be more encouraged if you are told to cast your cares upon the Lord who loves you and cares for you with an everlasting love? First or the second? Second. second. That's why it's important to look at everything even especially the topic of money and giving from an eternal and godly perspective. Author C.S. Lewis says in his book, The Joyful Christian, he says, Aim for heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim for earth, and you will get neither. So in talking about giving and finances, we talk about how this is connected with our relationship with God. We talk about having our lives and our hearts transformed by God how we are to be motivated by the Holy Spirit in such a way that in giving, we are transformed more and more into the image of Christ. We talk about letting God produce in us the fruit of generosity and encourage us to lead a lifestyle of lavish and generous living, which is the best way to live. So to look at things from a spiritual and eternal perspective, first we need to start uh, at the beginning. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth, and God saw all that He made, and it was good. All things, you know, all things, including our money, our finances, or our treasures, all things in the universe are created by God. And all were created good, although, you know, human beings, they can tend to make a good thing and turn it into something wicked and harmful. But the point is, all things ultimately belong to God. Nothing really belongs to us in the fullest or strictest sense. God is the only owner of all things, whether it is born or made or natural or constructed by people. And the proof that God is owner of all things is, you know, we, we brought nothing into this world. And when we die, we will bring nothing with us. You know, we were born naked into the world. Um, you didn't come out of your mother's womb with your clothes or your makeup or your possessions. 
Um, and when we physically leave this world, even if we are buried, you know, in your car, or most precious jewelry, or given your fav favorite food uh, with you, uh, buried with you, you know, we, we can't take that with us. No matter what it is you bury with a dead body, it will not go with the body. So we brought nothing into this world, and we will leave with nothing. And that means nothing is really ours. <laughs> so a very basic and important understanding of God's creation is that God is the maker and owner of all things. And that makes us stewards or managers of God's creation and property. We are asked to be managers of property that we don't even own. In Genesis, God told Adam and Eve to fill the earth and subdue it. They were to be fruitful and multiply, and they are to tend and take care of the garden. But they were not supposed to think that they owned the world just because they worked in the world. Now, I know our culture places a high value on hard work. You know, you work hard, and then you're supposed to get what you earn for your hard work. Uh, but, but the assumption that comes with that is that we own what we earn, or we own what we buy. But according to God, that's not how it really works. Um, for example, consider uh, the pyramids of Egypt. I mean, has anyone seen it firsthand, the pyramids of Egypt? Uh, they, they were mostly built by slaves. Uh, the slaves who built them did not think that they owned the pyramids. They thought that both the pyramids and themselves uh, belonged to the Pharaoh. You know, it's the same thing in our case, except that we don't belong to the Pharaoh. Uh, we belong to God. Our hard work, it may be rewarded, or it may not. Or our work may produce prosperity, or it may not. But whatever we earn or receive, it is all a gift from God. Whatever thing that we have is a gift that we use knowing that the true owner of the gift is God. So that cell phone you have, that uh, Torasa, uh, who does that belong to? Okay. Your money in the bank, uh, who owns that? Your clothes, your food, who owns that? And in case you're in the pew, in the pew you have a, a pen or a paka. <laughs> Who owns that? God. God. Okay. So, so you get that. Um, now, for all of you who may like politics or economics, uh, here's another way to look at it. God's economy is not communism. You know, the human government or the collective does not own your property. But God's economy is also not capitalist. Private individuals also really don't own anything, even if you have a deed of what it is, whatever it is. Instead, in God's economy, God owns everything, and God can do whatever He wants to do with anything. The Christian point of view is not, what's mine is mine, and if I choose to do it, I can share it with people because I'm very generous. You know, if you say that, you're assuming that you own the property. Uh, it is also not, What's yours is actually ours, and we must confiscate it or treat it as public property. I mean, that would be communism. Instead, for the Christian, in terms of our property and money, God owns it all. And we are to use our resources the way God wants us to do it. And we always need to ask God, what would you want me to do with your money? Why have you given this to me? We need to keep asking God what to do with what He has given us. So, what does God want us to do uh, with His money? One thing God wants us to do is to give back part of what is already His. Uh, Leviticus 27.30, it says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain or from the soil or fruit from the trees, belong to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Um, you know that there are actually more remarks in the Old Testament about tithing uh, than the afterlife. I mean, it tells you how important it is in terms of, you know, how important giving an offering is to God. God requires, uh, God calls for a tithe or a tenth of what is called the first fruits, the first good portion of the crop before people can use the rest. Uh, in principle, today that means that the tithe goes to the local church 
to the church that you consider your church home. The church is the New Testament representation of the Old Testament storehouse where the tithe is given to widows, and orphans, and priests, and the Levites. The church has a unique and special place in God's plan, and this is the one institution that really comes from the New Testament and the Gospel. Uh, you know, that is the local church. Other Christian ministries originated from the church, but their effectiveness depends on the effectiveness of the church. So a good rule of thumb is to give 10% uh, to your church, then give over and above that elsewhere. And anything above 10% is not called a tithe, uh, we kind of call that an offering, where it can include not just money, but skills, talents, and time. And that is why in the bulletin we call what you give tithes and offerings. So offering is separate and apart from the financial tithe. Now, God does not need your money, you know, because God can do anything with or without your money. But God is asking that we give a tithe to help us remember that everything belongs to God. And our giving back to Him is an act of worship. So when we tithe, it is not that we divided our things into what is God's portion and what is our portion. You know, like this 10% is God's property and this 90% is our property. Uh, all things still belong to God, even the 90%. What is amazing is that God does not ask for 100% back. So after talking about why we give to the church, last week we concentrated on how we give. We give with God first in mind. We give sacrificially. We give joyfully. And I explained what sacrificial and joyful giving is. You know, things like, you know, giving till it hurts. In other words, you give until it affects and changes the way you spend money on things. You also give cheerfully, meaning you give happy checks. Remember that? Happy checks. You know, because God, God's church is not going to be built on burden checks. You know, God wants happy checks. Not given under com cons uh, compulsion, but freely and voluntarily given. Now, you know, I think some of you may wonder if I'm going to talk about some other important questions and issues about giving or tithing, such as, um, do we give 10% of gross or net income? Uh, am I excused from giving money because I'm poor or I only have a small fixed income? Or what if I have a lot of debt? Or what if I modify what God says and, you know, Although I can afford the money, what if I can save more for myself by just giving 3% of my income to the church, but make up for it by giving my time and talent and maybe donate some books and other items to the church? Uh, you know, those kind of questions uh, may come up for, for some of you or a lot of you. And uh, here's how I'm going to answer those questions. Now, suppose God uh, is a basketball coach. Uh, basketball again, I already gave a basketball example previously. Uh, you know, God comes to us and wants to teach us how to be excellent basketball players. So God can say, you all need to get up early in the morning, you know, 4 or 5 a.m. You run a few miles. You lift some weights. You know, for two hours, you do some strength training. You do some shooting drills, dribbling. You know, eat right. Do this training five times a week and you will become a very effective basketball player or at least you're on your way to be very effective. But instead of that, what if God says, I want you to love the sport of basketball with all your heart and with all your soul. I want you to give everything you've got this basketball season. I want you to give the maximum excellence for the love of this game no matter what the outcome we will be winners on and off the court. Um, out of those two ways, which sets a higher standard? First way or second way? You know, the first way has rules and instructions. The second way does not concentrate on rules, but it goes to the heart and the spirit of things. So to answer your questions on giving, you know, gross or net, 10%, 2%, uh, some time and talent. Uh, to answer the questions, you need to ask yourself, 
from God's perspective, you know, not your perspective or my perspective, is what I am giving the highest standard that I can give. Is my giving to the church the maximum excellence that I can do? From God's point of view, not yours or mine, is my giving sacrificial, joyful, and abundantly rich? You know, while there's a lot of grace when it comes to giving, God does call us to excellence and to work and to develop more and more in us the spirit of giving. Is God for you a personal God? Or is God impersonal to you? I mean, so impersonal that you say to yourself, ah, oh, you know, I have to give to the poor. Or, oh no, I have to give to church. Or is God so personal to you that you have experienced His grace? That you know you will be lost without God? That your heart rests on His grace? And because of that, you want to give. And you want to give sacrificially, joyfully. And, you know, changing your budget, you know, that, that's not a problem. Now, that is sort of the basis or foundation for living generously. You know, give a tithe to your church, give to others above all that. Now, other than giving back something like 10%, God also asks us to be stewards and managers of the money that is left with us. Other than the 10%, we also need to be responsible for the 90% that we did not offer. Because the 90% of our income that we did not offer also belongs to God. So the money you have that you did not give away, it still does not belong to you. And how we manage that money makes a difference whether we can, you know, make living generously a long-term kind of lifestyle. So when you manage 90% the way God wants you to manage it, somehow God stretches and multiplies His money so you can give more and live a more generous life in the long run. So remember, the 90% that you didn't tithe also does not belong to you. Whatever you spend, we are called to account for it and use it the way God wants us to use it. I think a lot of you or most of you may be familiar with John Wesley, uh, right? He, he lived in the 18th century and was the leader of the Methodist movement. Um, we probably sing a number of his hymns and the hymns of his brother, Charles Wesley, most especially. Um, John Wesley once delivered a sermon that speaks about living generously as a lifestyle. In his sermon, his point is, make as much as you can, save as much as you can, and give as much as you can. So he made a lot of money, but he tried hard not to keep a lot of money. Um, in the end, he still died with a silver spoon. I mean, he died rich. Uh, he had a few good, good things to say about how to use money properly and how to save money and how to give money away. And I just want to highlight a few, just a few of his insights. First, he said that you need to make as much as you can. You ought to make as much as you can without hurting yourself or your neighbor spiritually or physically with all the gifts and the talents and the understanding that God has given you. I mean, that means you don't sacrifice your health for work and you don't sacrifice other people like your family for work. Uh, make money honestly and do good and excellent work. Second, he, sa he said save as much as you can. Do not buy things you don't really need to impress yourself or other people. You need to learn to live on less than what you make. You know, do not act like the, the U.S. Congress. You know, don't, don't be a slave to debt. Uh, remember that the borrower is a slave to the lender. So get on a budget. You may not do everything you want to do, but it's really not your money to just spend anyway. A lot of times the message that we get from our culture is, uh, you know what, you deserve a break. Spend everything you make because you deserve it. And, and yeah, that's a good feeling, right? <laughs> yep, we deserve a break. We want to do that. But the scripture today says, be content with what you have. Guard against materialism. Guard against the love or money. Now, some people may think materialism is a Western issue. You know, a problem only for people in 
uh, rich nations, uh, you know, like uh, Pradham about Farang or something, kind of. Uh, but I heard a story about a pastor from Nairobi, Kenya, who once said that the greatest obstacle in the gospel uh, in Africa is actually materialism. You know, people who live in mud huts in Africa wants a stone hut, and then they want a metal roof. And then people who are doing fine with one cow wants to have two cows. Uh, you know, so this, this goes on and on, and it goes to show that materialism is not something that's just in America. Materialism is a disease of the heart. It is about something in your heart that is not right. The love of money promises our hearts that we can have, you know, security, significance, success if we have enough. But we are to put our hope in Jesus, who, are the, who is the true hope for eternal security, significance, and success. So before you spend, you know, John Wesley gives us some questions we may want to ask ourselves. You know, before you spend, he says that you ask yourself, am I acting like the owner or am I acting like the steward? of the Lord's money? Am I spending this money in obedience to God's word? Can I offer this action of spending as a sacrifice to God through Christ? For what I am going to do with this money and what it does, will it, does it deserve some kind of a heavenly type of reward? I mean, those are sort of interesting questions to ask ourselves in terms of managing the financial resources that God has given us. Again, before you spend, you know, ask yourself, am I doing this as an owner or as a steward of God's money? Is spending on this, am I obeying God's word? Can this spending be like a pleasing and sweet-smelling offering to God? And in doing this, is this action honorable enough to get some kind of reward in heaven? I mean, it would be interesting to see how you will say by applying these questions. Now, you know, saving doesn't mean you won't spend on anything. And uh, I know that there's a lot of people who, you know, you may even get a thrill whenever, you know, you got a deal on something, uh, something you want to purchase, right? You know, there's uh, some sort of a thrill in that. Uh, for a lot of people, it's like a, an excitement because, you know, instead of paying for full price, you get a discount, you know, a steep discount, uh, you know, a bargain. Uh, notice when you buy groceries, uh, if you buy groceries at Rouse, uh, with your club card, the checkout person at the register make sure you know how much you save money from buying today's groceries at Ralph's. Uh, you know, just, just the other day, the checkout person told me, uh, you saved $10 today uh, on your purchase. You know, and, and with that, it was easy to get a thrill. You know, it's a, it's a good feeling. It's like you save money. Like you're feeling pretty successful. Uh, and nothing is wrong with that. The only thing you need to remember is you are not saving just to get a thrill. <laughs> Uh, of saving money. You are thrilled of saving because that means you have more money to give and to bless others. It means you have more money to spend in the way God wants you to spend. Uh, money is a resource and when used correctly it is supposed to be used to bless others. So if we have that perspective it will help us make better decisions, break the power of money in our lives and lead us towards real financial wisdom and freedom. Uh, third, other than making as much as you can and saving as much as you can, uh, John Wesley says, give as much as you can. Proverbs 21, 26 says, the greedy always wants more, but the godly loves to give and does not hold back. And the more godly you become from giving, the more generous you get to be. At the end of the day, we should value our riches in Christ so highly, our status as Christians so highly, and the gospel so highly that we would love to give. Remember also that God promises to bless the faithful giver. And the more God blesses you, the more you're able to give and live a lifestyle of lavish generosity. Let us pray. A gracious God, your Son, Jesus Christ, once said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. You love us and you want us to live our life on earth in faith, hope, love, and lavish generosity. 
Help us come to a place where we treasure you more instead of the gifts that you have given us. Instill more and more in our hearts the love of Christ who has given his own life so that we can live and give generously. In Jesus' name, amen.